Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you to the annual academic sessions org organized by the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists for the year 2023. I warmly welcome you also for the first symposium for the day. And the theme for the first symposium is the respiratory medicine for general practitioners. This, um, theme, this theme will be discussed by various dignitaries and I cordially invite Dr. Geetal Pereira, consultant respiratory physician, and Dr. Preeti Vijayagunwadana, family physicians, to chair this event. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, first session of uh, Respire 13. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce the speakers without much ado. Um, our sp first speaker today is Dr. Amita Fernando, my trainer. And uh, I'm sure he's going to keep you entertained with uh, how to treat difficult cough. Thank you, Gita. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so cough is a common symptom, as you all know. Uh, so this would be an outline of my talk. I will talk about the burden, impact, some definition, etiology of chronic cough, the diagnostic workup, uh, and I will touch on a clinical case and talk a little bit on uh, chronic refractory cough and other uh, associated syndromes. You can see the em emphasis or importance of, of chronic cough because this is when I googled on the internet, I found this book, Chronic Refractory Cough Epidemiology. It's a it's a like a research document uh, pred with predicts where the pharmaceutical industry and research should focus on. So the discounted part, so they predict how the uh, the trajectory of chronic cough would evolve over the years, and this is they say to up 2032, uh, the discounted price is six thousand six thousand dollars. So, so you can see that that, that would be about at today's 370 rate, about 2.2 million rupees. So you can see the emphasis, the industry and the pharmaceutical, the industry and the researchers play, uh, play on the imports of these common symptoms that we encounter in day-to-day -day clinical practice. So it's estimated about 10% of the population persist, uh, presents with this uh, un undiagnosed or persistent or chronic cough. Uh, globally, in some regions like Australia and the developed part of the world, it's about 15 to 20 percent. But in uh, other Asian regions, uh, the data suggests about 10 percent prevalence, and it's in the, uh, su the, tr the, the subcontinent overshadowed by infective diseases like tuberculosis. Uh, so chronic cough shouldn't be taken in isolation as a symptom. It's more a, s a syndrome with allied other involvement of other organ systems. So, and the good thing about chronic cough is if you are familiar with uh, uh, algorithmic based approach to managing chronic cough, you can come to a diagnosis majority of the time. So the, the chronic cough may have a imp uh, physical impact in which urinary incontinence is a common thing. About 40% of females with chronic cough have urinary incontinence, but only 4% will mention that unless directly cons uh, consulted, uh, unless directly questioned in a consultation. So it causes a lot of social embarrassment. They will tell, we have to wear pads and go. We are socially embarrassed. Uh, we are very, very conscious of this. Uh, in addition, you may get uh, symptoms like hoarseness of voice, poor quality sleep, headache, uh, ready muscle pain, cervical root pain, uh, cough syncope is an alarming symptom, uh, some arrhythmias, vertebral artery dissection, pneumothoraces, and subcutaneous emphysema has been described. Uh, the effects of paroxysmal cough can be socially embarrassing. Uh, it can r r lead to social isolation. It can people can be stigmatized as having tuberculosis and other infective diseases. So some def definitions: acute cough is a cough that lasts less than three weeks duration. Subacute cough, a cough that lasts three to eight weeks duration. Chronic cough is a cough that is uh, that is more than eight weeks duration. And I'll touch upon this topic about chronic refractory cough, uh, unexplained cough. Uh, hypersens cough hypersensitivity or sensory neuro neuropathic cough. Various terms have been used to describe this syndrome, which I'll be talking about later. So that, that's the the latter, the latter group is a uh, is a uh, group of it's a cough uh, that doesn't fall into this guideline-based management and does not respond to the guideline-based management of chronic cough. So the three R's, as they say, of chronic cough is rhinosinusitis or the upper airway cough syndromes. Uh, previously called, caused post-nasal drip syndrome. Uh, the next R is reflux, uh, which could be uh, non-acid reflux, laryngeopharyngeal reflux, uh, and acid reflux. And then a reactive airway into which cough variant asthma and other etiologies will fall in. There's also uh, 
chronic cough. This, this is a cough lasting more than eight weeks. Duration beyond the three hours, which is chronic bronchitis, in which case uh, occupational and uh, environmental irritants can give rise to a chronic bronchitis. Uh, environmental tobacco smoking, and we have a session on vaping. We should ask because there's vaping is also fairly common in our society these days. Uh, then drugs like ACE inhibitor, it has been associated with citagitaprine, but I haven't encountered any patients and we, ha we haven't really looked at cita as a cause of chronic cough. Then there is the post-infectious cough and adult pertussis. There's the eosinophilic cough syndrome, asthma uh, and allied things and tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, which we do not uh, see that much in clinical practice now. So you should be mindful of the red flags of chronic cough. Uh, in way, so in your history, you should look for hemoptysis, unexplained uh, cough in a smoker, fever, loss of weight, loss of appetite, constitutional symptoms, uh, uh, contact history of tuberculosis, prominent symptoms of breathlessness, hoarse voice, voice, difficulty in swallowing, abnormal physical signs on respiratory examination, and cardiovascular examination, and abnormal biochemistry and radiography. So chronic, chronic cough can be the manifestation of known uh, lung disease like COPD, interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, pulmonary vascular disease, and cardiac diseases like mitral valve disease and congestive cardiac failure. Uh, so rhinosinusitis, uh, allergic rhinitis, predominantly allergy, known triggers like asthma triggers, itchy, runny, watery kind of nose, sinusitis, more congested symptoms, blocked, uh, blocked nose, uh, headaches, and, also, uh, and loss of smell, uh, and headaches, sinusal headaches that we'll have. Uh, so, and there are various etiologies and things. And there are also other etiologies, uh, non-allergic uh, rhinitis, which could be due to irritants, which could be seasonal, which could be uh, senile vasomotor rhinitis, and uh, which could be due to uh, pregnancy-induced rhinitis also. Uh, rhinitis also has its red, red flags, uh, CSF rhinorrhea, base of skull fracture, one side nasal discharge, clear water discharge from one side of the nose, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinomas, uh, and vasculitic diseases like uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, vaginus formally, Schurg Strauss, and other things, aspirin hypersensitivity, and fungal sinusitis, especially post COVID patients who have been on steroids, diabetics, you should be mindful of these etiologies. Then the next R is reflux, in which could be acid reflux or non acid reflux. Acid reflux has the characteristic features of dyspepsia, acid brush, uh, regurgitation, and things. Non acid reflux is mainly a postural thing due to gastro gastroesophageal uh, junction dysmotility. Uh, it's mostly pepsin related, and this can uh, re the reflux can go all the way up to your larynx, pharynx, giving rise to this condition called laryngeopharyngeal reflux, in, in which case patients have a paroxysm of cough, and this is uh, followed by stridor. Patients will say like, kahela kahela usmagarna kota udata usmalan beh palleh dagan beh udata palleh dagan beh, and they they say that they run around and they have to move around. Uh, and uh, so it's sometimes mistaken for asthma and nebulized and all. So this is due to spasm of the vocal cords, inappropriate adduction with the paroxysmal of, paroxysm of cough. So a clinical history to see whether this is acid reflux or non-acid reflux. Non-acid reflux, mostly a dry cough, occurs 10 minutes after eating or during eating, triggered by talking, cough, uh, singing, and uh, talking on the phone in particular, and posture like lying down, going to uh, in the bed or getting up in the morning, a posture-related cough, uh, an acid reflux, you know. So the, the, the way of diagnosing this is esophageal pH monitoring and also maintaining a cough diary, seeing which events stimulate this cough and which uh, where the patient, uh, what, what events trigger a cough so that you can rela uh, relate your pH monitoring to your uh, cough diary. So a reactive airway uh, uh, or uh, cough variant asthma uh, and, the, and other syndromes of a reactive airway, like the non-asthma eosinophilic bronchitis, tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, and con related conditions. Asthma-like sy symptoms, but cough is the main and only symptoms, triggered by the same asthma uh, triggers, uh, and may show some diurnal variation. So this cough is associated with no physical signs in the chest, no wheezing, no breathlessness, but predominantly a cough. And uh, the only way of diagnosing this is doing the bronchial challenge tests with methacholine, uh, otherwise, it's difficult to diagnose this condition. So there are non-asthma eosinophilic cough syndrome, like eosinophilic bronchitis, in which the sputum will show, will show, will show a eosinophilia. In our country, we have to be mindful of tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, though not that common now. Uh, again, this we, many, these respond to asthma medication, like inhaled steroids and bronchodilators. 
So tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, you know, uh, they have constitutional symptoms, fever, a paroxysm, cough, a paroxysm of cough followed by a, a whoop or a, a whoop, uh, and they have radiological changes and they may have constitutional symptoms and e elevated ESR. The absolute eosinophil count is more than 3,000. Uh, in some cases, mild rises in eosinophilia is mainly due to allergic rhinitis and maybe a cough variant asthma. So ACE inhibitor induced cough, uh, it can be seen uh, within one week or six months after initiation of treatment. It is main, it, various mechanisms have been postulated, a uh, bradykinin mechanism, but the, it's thought that it, is, it lowers your cough threshold and uh, previously subclinical post-nasal rip or reflux may, uh, may, may manifest because the ACE uh, inhibitors uh, reduce your cough threshold. So this has not been associated with uh, ACE receptor, angiotensin receptor blockers, only the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So it's important to uh, be aware of this ask and ask for information in your history. And sometimes even after top, topping the drug, it may take some time for the cough to completely resolve. Uh, chronic bronchitis, again, uh, you know, occupational and domestic irritants. We know that now, so this due to the present social and economic crisis, uh, fuel restrictions, people, pe people switch to biomass. We saw asthma exacerbations and chronic coughs manifesting as a, use, as a result of using biomass. So we must be, take a detailed history and also be mindful of occupational and domestic triggers. I would also like to say that you should ask about vaping now because we see some uh, uh, students and class of peop people who, are, who indulge in this practice. Uh, so whooping cough uh, or pertussis, adult pertussis, it may come in coming to uh, outbreaks. Usually people have a, like coryza and uh, upper airway symptoms, uh, nasal congestion and, a, uh, and a, uh, an episode of fever. Uh, they have the these characteristic uh, spasms of cough and, uh, and so uh, the adult pertussis should be treated with macrolides and the blood picture may show atypical lymphocytes. Uh, and features are, that are suggestive of adult pertussis. So the, your gamut of investigations on this patient, basic investigation, always be mindful of the red flags, would involve imaging, imaging chest radiographs, sinuses, uh, CT, HRCT, high resolution CT scans, sinus CT scans. Uh, in patients whom you are thinking of uh, asthma related uh, symptoms or uh, eosinophilic cough syndrome, uh, your skin prick test, IgE, uh, spirometry, uh, exhale breath nitric oxide in, in specialized center, uh, centers, bronchial challenge test will be involved. Upper airway uh, ENT re referral, ENT review is important. Uh, some patients may require bronchoscopy, but not all, uh, because these patients usually the uh, investigation imaging are normal and would, do not show any pointers towards uh, other more sinister etiologies. So also you must be mindful that some of these uh, cough syndromes are multifactorial. There may be a post-nasal drip associated with reflux. So one or two, there may be several, more than one etiology for these coughs. And the heartening thing about this series of uh, studies is that the success rate, if you look at, look at the success rate with a clear guideline-based based management about the su treatment success rate is in their high 90s, except for in one study, uh, all are about 90 uh, in their 90s, which shows that with a guideline-based approach, that you can come to a very good uh, diagnosis. So this is a 54-year-old female who presented with a cough of three months duration. Cough was present throughout most part of the day, mostly dry. Uh, she was able to bring out sputum only with difficulty. She was diabetic, but diabetes well controlled. She was on antihypertensives, but not an AC mid-dress. She had symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, she, she had dyspeptic symptoms, but those were, were well treated uh, with uh, proton pump inhibitors, and she had uh, good control of her reflux symptoms. She had a mild OSA, she had snoring but no OSA, and she had no other feature to suggest uh, eosinophilic cough syndrome or asthma-like syndrome. Uh, on more detailed questioning, she said that uh, she, uh, she's cough was triggered by posture, lying down, talking at length, talking on the phone, air conditioning, getting into the vehicle, suddenly the AC switched on, she starts coughing, blowing off a fan, strong odors such as cooking smells triggered the cough. She said that she get, got an int intense desire to cough and the cough came in paroxysmal and she experienced an itching or dryness in her throat before the onset of the cough. So she had these symptoms which we call uh, alotasia, which means that uh, trivial triggers which would normally not cause a cough will give rise to a cough, like lying down in bed, certain postures, su touching certain parts of the neck, uh, talking at length on the phone, singing, things like that. 
uh, sudden change in temperature, you get into the vehicle, this AC comes on, and you get a cough. Uh, the blowing of a fan causes cough. So they have a, uh, they ha they, that is called alotasia. These are trivial uh, triggers which may will not cause cough in a normal person. And then there's hypertasia, which means an exaggerated response to a stimulus that would cause cough in a normal person. So they, they get an exaggerated paroxysmal response to like fur, perfume, strong odors and things. So uh, they have, in this group of patients, there is evidence of neuronal hyperactivity uh, by this, uh, especially by these triggers, and the other is the sensory prodrome, and the patient will say, there is itching, scratching. Once a patient told me, and like that, there's, there's a lot of sensory symptoms involved before the onset of cough. So is cough hypersensitive syndrome a dis distinct sy syndrome? Is there evidence, uh, clinical, neurophysiological, and pharmacological to support this? Uh, there is, because uh, as I said, there is a neuronal prodrome in these patients, and this, then they have this cough, and various uh, analysis of bronchial botches have shown that cough mediators are increased in bronchial washes. They wash, there's upregulation of cough receptors, and they respond to neuromodulating agents like gabapentin, amitriptyline, and this new drug, the P2X3 antagonist, gefipixent and olipixent. So my patient was treated with uh, gabapentin initially. Uh, you can up, slowly start and up titrate the dose. Uh, guidelines suggest you can go up to 1,800, but our patients will never tolerate such big doses. Uh, mostly 300 at night and 100 in the morning, but you have to carefully monitor these uh, patients. Uh, and amitriptyline is used. Uh, the, the guidelines again suggest you can go up to 80 milligrams, but beyond 25 milligrams, our patients will develop uh, symptoms of drowsiness. And so, uh, and you must be mindful that this can overlap with other conditions like the th things we discussed. Uh, a heightened cough reflex or hypersensitivity can be can overlap with drugs, acid or non-acid reflux, uh, other uh, rhinitis and things, eosinophilic inflammation. So your history must also include this because they can overlap with these conditions. Uh, not only is there, uh, there is also other evidence of laryngeal hypersensitivity. Cough is one manifestation of laryngeal hypersensitivity. There can be other manifestations like vocal cord dysfunction in which dyspnea is the pre predominant symptom, upper airway dyspnea, patient for, for find their vocal cords, a pause when they're trying to, uh, when they're breathing, uh, during inspiration and expiration, they will exp experience a tightness in the upper chest or thro throat, and sometimes flow, flow volume loops will show a biphasic uh, inspiratory, uh, inspiratory limb. Uh, so vocal cord dysfunction can al is also upper airway, uh, upper airway, dis uh, upper airway dyspnea syndrome. Uh, in which you, 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 it can occur in patients with laryngeal hypersensitivity. Then chronic cough I described. Then the other thing is globus, in which patients have a sensation of a lump in the throat. There's a lump in the throat, they, which is not preventing them from uh, swallowing anything. You have been mindful of red flags and other causes of dysphagia. But globus is another manifestation of a hypersensitive larynx. And then you can get dysphonia, in which case uh, the patients have uh, hoarseness or their voice changes that can occur. So chronic cough is one uh, arm of manifestation of laryngeal hypersensitivity, but uh, there can be other dysphonias, vocal cord dysfunction, globus, uh, also occurring in patients with hi hypersensitivity. So uh, as treatment I mentioned, we use neuromodulating drugs like gabapentin, amitriptyline, uh, we use uh, refer these patients to physio speech therapist who will t teach various laryngeal relaxa relaxation techniques. You should ask the patient to take sips of water. Sometimes when you take ask patient to drink water, they will have a thermos flask full of hot water. Uh, so you have to be careful where, when you tell these things. Uh, and the other thing is you can ask ask the patient to practice swallowing, chewing, because that will distract the nerves from the function of coughing to another action. Like that, uh, speech therapist will give them various techniques of cough suppression. Uh, you can also inject uh, uh, drugs like bot botulinism into your arytenoids to cause relaxation of your vocal cords and reduce this hypersensitive larynx. Uh, so uh, the speed, so you have been chronic cough and chronic refractory cough are important etiology, important conditions that sh you should be mindful of. Uh, and if you have a proper guideline-based approach, if, if you have a practical approach, you're mindful of the red flags uh, and you know the uh, know these patients and uh, you can explain it to the, the, your patient. Uh, it, it is very 
rewarding because the patients are very happy because they have been going from place to place without any relief of their symptoms and they have been trying various remedies including cough remedies uh, again without relief so if you have a proper guideline based approach if you are mindful of the red flags and know when to refer patients when you when you think that this uh, when, when appropriate uh, it's a rewarding condition to treat and it's also very very lucrative because if you see the various centers uh, that have that treat chronic cough Harley Street Cough Center and various uh, cough centers and a uh, lot of tertiary care hospitals uh, run cough, chronic cough centers and unexplained breathless centers. So whenever our postgraduate trainees go, I tell them, see whether your hospital has a chronic cough clinic, go to your chronic cough clinic, you go to your chronic breathlessness clinic. So this is where you will see this, these patients and this is where I learn how to approach these patients. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that uh, very comprehensive and practical lecture. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll keep the questions to the last. Uh, then my next speaker will be introduced by Dr. Vijay Kunathan. Thank you, Amita. That was a brilliant presentation in 20 minutes. Great for keeping time. Uh, next, we have Dilemmas in the Treatment of Preschool Wheezing by Dr. Aruna Herat. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, uh, College of Pulmonologists, for inviting me uh, to deliver this presentation. Uh, so, shall we start? Okay. So, I, I'm going to uh, talk about the dilemmas in uh, management of uh, preschool wheezing. And uh, so, uh, actually, as we all know, wheezing is a high pitch uh, whistling, uh, mainly expiratory breath sounds, which is produced by the airway narrowing, either intramural, intrinsic, or intri extrinsic pathology. So, intrinsic bronchospasm, which occur usually occurs in the asthma and the uh, um, like preschool wheezing, is one etiology, just one etiology of wheezing. A lot of other etiologies are there in the pediatric practice, and this, this etiology also can present in different ways in <coughs> different age groups. So, what is preschool wheezing? Preschool wheezing is a bronchoconstrictive wheezing, bronchoconstrictive wheezing, which occurs in the children between the age of either 1 to 5 or 1 to 6, uh, uh, depending on the uh, different guidelines. So, why, why this specific uh, time is important? Because uh, less than one year, usually, uh, the common presentation is bronchiolitis. The pathophysiology is different from the wheezing, and the treatment is also uh, different, and they usually do not respond to the wheezing treatment. And after the age of six years, it's usually the school age wheezing, or it is more or less like adult type of wheezing, and that is also not responding to the uh, certain uh, management plans. So, this is uh, uh, like uh, distinct, but there are uh, qu quite a lot of overlaps between the infantile bronchospasm, school age wheezing, school age wheezing, preschool age wheezing, and school age asthma. So, these are very common, and but it is very poorly understood and imperfectly defined entity. As it is very common, uh, we will see how common is that. Uh, in the literature, it was like described in different ages. In 1995, it says approximately one third of the children has at least one episode of wheezing by the age of three years. And in uh, 2013, uh, they say it uh, almost 50% of the children experience uh, wheezing in the first six years of life. Or, uh, so uh, it indicates, you can see, this is very common. At least, according to that, at least 50% of the children experience at least one episode of wheezing by the age of six years. So, as it is very common, as uh, general, general practitioners and especially pediatricians, we have to answer very few common questions. So, first is from the parents, is this asthma? And if we say no, then they will ask, can my child develop asthma in later? Or does he need long-term treatment and especially inhalers because in Sri Lanka still the people think inhalers should be the last option of the asthma management and also they, they think it is the worst option of asthma management. That is totally wrong. And uh, despite this common occurrence, uh, relatively there is a little evidence available regarding the pathophysiology and the treatment of the preschool wheezing. So in order to... Uh, have some idea, we should study the characteristics of the preschool wheezing. So, few common characteristics are uh, 
uh, like frequency of the episode. So most children wheeze occasionally. In preschool wheezing, most of them uh, wheeze occasionally, but some can wheeze very frequently, even few episodes per month. And severity also varies. Some are very mild, some may be uh, severe, or some can be even life-threatening. And the temporal pattern is also variable. Sometimes uh, they uh, wheeze like uh, to only uh, with the viral cough. Sometimes they wheeze in between the viral uh, upper respiratory tract infections. And the duration also, uh, the duration of symptoms also the same. Some wheeze less, uh, like some some people the symptoms may be kids uh, symptoms may be less than ten days, and some some kids it may be sometimes two weeks, more than two weeks, and. Uh, so, the classification is very important in order to uh, prognostication as well as the therapy. Several classifications are there in the literature regarding the preschool wheezing, but most of them are, uh, they have classified the kids retrospectively. That means we have to go through the kids for several years in order to classify. This is very not important to uh, do the individual uh, clinical decision making. So I will uh, give you about three uh, very common classifications. The uh, first is uh, done by the Respir uh, European Respiratory Society uh, and Task Force report in 2008. They classified uh, uh, chronic cough into two major categories. Uh, uh, that means episodic viral wheezing and multiple trigger wheezing. We all know that we also still practice in that. So, in episodic viral wheezing, they usually wheeze together only with the uh, viral infections, but uh, they are relatively symptom-free in between. But in multiple trigger wheezing, usually they uh, they uh, also uh, develop wheezing during viral infection, but sometimes, m most of the time, they have some symptoms, interval symptoms, we say. Uh, they usually have uh, significant symptoms during the infection, some interval symptoms like night cough, shortness of breath on exertion, and uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, these kind of symptoms in between the episodes. Oh, okay, so uh, even though this is very common and still we are practicing, there are a lot of limitations in this uh, classification because like um, at that time, uh, when they do the recommendation, it was based on very limited uh, resources uh, data. And also, uh, they also they, they also uh, themselves uh, thought that recommendation may be changed very uh, recently when the evidence are available and despite these limitations it gains a wide spectrum acceptance throughout the world and uh, then ers itself uh, reconsider in 2014 and they uh, point out the limitations of this uh, classification because they, they in this classification actually it was solely based on the temporal pattern. They have never uh, considered about the severity of the uh, severity of the episodes. They have never considered about the duration of the episodes. They only think about the uh, temporal pattern of the symptoms. And uh, then. Uh, they have uh, uh, they have proposed. Uh, and also they have mentioned that um, this uh, uh, viral induced wheezing and multi-triggered wheezing are not two entities because uh, sometimes viral induced uh, wheezing can change into multiple trigger wheezing. Sometimes multiple trigger wheezing can change into viral induced wheezing with time. And uh, so uh, after that, uh, the, that's another uh, well-known classification was uh, introduced by the uh, Chosen Children's Respiratory Study. They classified uh, people into kids into four groups. That is, uh, uh, kids never wheeze during the preschool uh, preschool uh, age group and transient early wheezes, persistent wheezes, and late onset wheezes. And these uh, transient, visa, uh, transient early visas usually start to wheeze before the age of three years and they end at the age of three years. The persistent visas, they start to wheeze before three years, but it goes beyond three years. And the late onset visas usually start to wheeze after three years. But the thing is, this is also the very retrospective classification, so we cannot start treatment based on these classifications. So Gina recently introduced more practical uh, classification, which is probability-based approach. And uh, this is based on the pattern of symptoms during and in between the viral uh, respiratory infection. 
So according to the Gina, we can classify this very important because I like to, I personally like to stick to this classification because Gina usually annually update their uh, management plans and everything. So according to this, we can classify kids into three groups. In the first group, uh, only few will have asthma. In the second group, the some will have asthma. In the third group, more. Uh, more, most of the peer kids will have asthma. In the first group, usually symptoms last less than 10 days and they develop around 2 to 3 uh, CV episodes per uh, year or significant episodes per year. They do not have interval symptoms. The second group, each episode usually lasts more than 10 days and they usually have more than 3 episodes per year and they have a uh, bit of a... Uh, uh, interval symptoms also. In the third group, apart from the, uh, the symptoms in the second group, they have the features of atopy, like allergic sensitization or the family history of, uh, family history of allergy, family history of uh, asthma, like that. And uh, so at last, uh, here also Gina also say, uh, says these groups can interchange between them. So sometimes a uh, kid can uh, categorize into the that few have asthma group and he will move into the some have asthma group or vice versa. So always you have to follow up the kids. So at last preschool wheezing uh, is a, some sort of a common outcome of a range of pathophysiological patho mechanisms and it is impossible to break the patient down into the exclusive subgroup and it does not remain constant over time in that subgroup. Okay, so keeping that in mind, because it is very like, uh, uh, treatment is very difficult because uh, there are no clear definition and no clear understanding of the pathology of the uh, preschool wheezing. So uh, in order to uh, start treatment, it, uh, uh, yeah, treatment has two pathways. One is, as we all know, the management of the acute episodes and the uh, planning the maintenance therapy. Uh, so, uh, uh, ERS uh, Task Force 2008, they propose the first choice of the controller therapy. I will, I will uh, discuss about the controller therapy first because like it is a bit challenging. The acute management is more or less same in all, all sort of guidelines. And uh, when you talk about the maintenance therapy in 2018, ERS Task Force uh, uh, proposed first choice of controller therapy as inhaled corticosteroid for multiple trigger wheezing and Montelukast for the uh, episodic viral wheezing. And uh, also they say sometimes we can use Montelukast for the multi-trigger wheezing but and also we can use inhaled corticosteroids for the uh, episodic viral wheezing if the episodic viral wheezing is very frequent and they have family history of asthma. And also all the other sort of medicine like uh, ketotifans and teens and these kind of things are not recommended for the uh, viral induced wheezing. That is also very important. And uh, after reconsidering uh, the recommendations they have done in 2004, uh, 2008, in 2014, ERS consensus guideline statement, they mentioned inhale corticosteroids as the first line of treatment for both multi-trigger wheezing and the viral induced wheezing if it is indicated. And uh, the main indications uh, should not be based on the uh, like uh, that um, phenotyping. It should be, we should consider frequency of symptoms uh, and the frequency of the severe acute episodes when we considering the uh, when we considering the uh, maintenance treatment and uh, when we start Montelukast and when we start inhaled corticosteroid for these small kids the main thing we have to consider is uh, we all we all know the inhaled corticosteroid is having side effects so we usually uh, consider that we don't go for the high doses uh, because it can cause some sort of a linear growth reduction in small, small, very small age group. And uh, so we should educate the parents 
most of the time this is like uh, this is transient when we stop it they will regain the normal uh, height but uh, the most important thing is when you are prescribing the montelukast most of the time our uh, pedi uh, pediatricians as well as general uh, practitioners prescribe montelukast unlimitedly but in other countries it is a very restricted restricted drug we cannot prescribe it it's very easily but it because it causes a lot of side effects, neuropsychiatric side effects in kids, uh, which including uh, the sleep disturbances, hyperactivity, and in the, uh, like, adolescents, uh, suicidal behavior. Uh, so, uh, uh, we should consider when we start uh, 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 maintenance treatment, it is absolutely indicated. And when we start maintenance treatment, most important thing is this is not for a long period, not for years. It is. It should be start as a treatment trial for the period of three months in preschool age. So at the end of, end of three months, you should reassess. When we reassessing it, uh, two things can happen. One thing is if uh, they uh, uh, if the they do not show any sort of a benefit after three months, you should stop treatment without escalating, and you should refer for the investigations because there should be some other pathology like congenital lung diseases or something. And if they are uh, responding to treatment well, it can be due to the uh, due to two reasons. One reason is that uh, they are uh, mean they are responding to the treatment, or they, it can be due to the natural history. So again, you should stop the treatment after three months and see what is happening. If it is a uh, natural history, it will not recur, and if it is due to the treatment benefit, it will recur. Then you have to restart the treatment and do the tailing off and keep the minimum dose again for three months, and then try to stop it again. And uh, Gina uh, proposed uh, almost a similar uh, sort of guidelines for the management of uh, preschool age asthma. They say uh, preschool age asthma. And according to the latest guideline, 2023, they have four steps. In the stage one, uh, as sta step one, they have categorized the infrequent viral visas who do not have significant, uh, who do not have significant interval symptoms and they do not prescribe any sort of a regular treatment for this category. Instead of that, what they want is to give a intermittent high dose inhaled corticosteroids together with the acute episode if the episode is severe. And this intermittent high dose inhaled corticosteroid, we can go up to 1600 micrograms per day, beclomethasone or equivalents, divided into four doses, nearly for five to ten days. That is, uh, it is important to give this than start oral steroids during the acute episodes. But still, it has significant side effects in the small kids. And uh, then. Uh, Yeah, the stage three is uh, children who's having uh, frequent wheezing, uh, more than uh, at least three or more frequent wheezing episodes per year, who do not have the features of asthma. So for that group, they prescribe uh, inhaled corticosteroid as the first options they do not uh, mention uh, uh, montelukast as the first option and they pr uh, propose inhaled corticosteroid as the first option and uh, as a second option they have uh, mentioned uh, uh, leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist and uh, based on the systemic reviews we clearly show in regular inhaled cost corticosteroids are superior to the leukotriene receptor antagonist monotherapy uh, and uh, these third and fourth steps are usually for the uh, asthma actually, not for the preschool wheezing because like the, uh, the wheezers, if they have the uh, like features of asthma, they, they asthma, Gina has separately laid down the, the features which is more favorable for asthma. So this is uh, not a good time to discuss that. If they have uh, the features of asthma together with the preschool wheezing, then we can go for the stage uh, three and four. 
and uh, in stage 3 that means if the uh, kids are not responding to the low dose inhaled corticosteroid still they have uh, recommended the double low dose or medium dose inhaled corticosteroids here what i have to point out is in uh, stage 3 still they did uh, they do, uh, they do not recommend inhaled corticosteroid plus long acting beta agonist that we are very frequently using in the general practice because the uh, safety uh, and efficacy is not uh, like well documented in this age group but still uh, we use it uh, and um, yeah it's it's still in very, very commonly we are using it and stage 4 anyhow they have uh, given a place for inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonist uh, in combination uh, because if we can't uh, control with the other measures and, and at this stage 4, they have also uh, given, um, uh, given uh, the permission to use uh, oral corticosteroids for the few days and use intermittent high-dose inhaled corticosteroid while we are using the regular low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. So these are the uh, things to manage. Uh, that means uh, long-term management. And uh, if you are talking about the treating the acute wheezing episodes, in all sort of all the guidelines, they use uh, inhale short-acting beta agonist use, uh, as a first line of treatment. And even in 2008, ERS not recommending the oral oral um, beta agonist, but still in Sri Lanka, the, our first choice is oral. And in the other countries. It is not using for now nearly two decades. And apart from that, we can use uh, thiotropium bromide together with the uh, beta agonist. And there's, a, uh, there's another debatable uh, topic is whether we can use oral corticosteroid in small kids during the acute episodes. Yes, there's a place. Uh, there's a place of trial of oral corticosteroids uh, if the preschool wheezing is uh, too severe to admit. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Aruna. Uh, thank you, Aruna, for that very interesting uh, lecture on children. Uh, we are going to the next, uh, the other end of uh, uh, the spectrum now with Dr. Andrew Emerson uh, from Australia. He's a consultant geriatrician. Uh, from the University of Sydney. He'll be joining us online. He'll be talking to us on respiratory diseases in the elderly. Is it difficult? Shall we move on to the next lecture because we have a little technical issue. Uh, so we can listen to him uh, after this one. Ruan and uh, Dr. Vijay Gunadhanan will introduce. Yeah, thank you. We'll move on to the next one till we get this technical issue sorted out. May I invite Dr. Ruanti Jayasekara, consultant respiratory physician. She'll talk to us on sleep-related breathing disorders. Over to you, Ruanti. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, my task today is to talk to you on uh, sleep-related breathing disorders. Uh, so uh, I will try to do justice to this topic uh, within the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so I'll try to, uh, as I said, I will try to do justice to this topic in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the outline of my talk is, so I would like to uh, touch a little on sleep before I jump into sleep disorders. And then uh, we'll move on to the real topic of the day, the sleep-related breathing disorders, and we'll discuss the evaluation and the management. <coughs> so sleep is nothing new to us. We do it every day or every night. Uh, but the actual definition is the sleep is a reversible behavioral state of perceptual disengagement and relative unresponsiveness to the environment. It is a state where we are put in great danger where, this, where, where in the darkness we are sleeping, we're relatively unresponding to the environmental cues, then why has nature allocated such a long time of the 24 hours for sleep? What is the purpose of sleep? That is a common question that um, has been asked throughout the decades, and scientists, especially in the turn of the, uh, the 20th century, has tried to um, 
do research and try to find out. But when you ask, what is the purpose of sleep? I would like to ask you in turn, do you exactly know what is the purpose of wakefulness? What are we doing here in the daytime? What is the purpose? So sleep accompanies us all along from life, uh, all along our life from birth to death, and we sleep about one third of our life. And sleep, well, as has been suspected all along uh, in the sleep uh, research, fulfills essential fu functions to keep the brain and body able to an answer the challenges of wakefulness. <coughs> so um, the, a common question is, what is normal sleep? How much should, why, how much should I sleep? Um, what is the normal prescription for sleep? And um, before that, I would like to um, take a brief uh, look at the three vigilant states described in mammals. The three vigilant states are described according to the brain EEG waves. When you are awake, you have high frequency, low am amplitude, desynchronized, chaotic EEG waves, which are very different in each part of the brain. That is when you have in your when you, you hear you you get visual input, you get auditory input, you have all sorts of inputs, and you have a lot of chaotic EEG waves. And then you go to sleep and you go into light sleep, and it is called the non-REM or the non-rapid eye movement or slow wave sleep. So you go, I will show you in the next diagram how you move from slow wave to deep sleep, slow sleep, light sleep to deep sleep. You start off with low frequency, high amplitude waves, and they become slower and slower and calmer, and ultimately you go into deep sleep where you develop delta oscillations. And there is low, EM, uh, low muscular activity, low EMG activity, and no ocular movement. And then you go on to REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, which is also called paradoxical sleep. It is called paradoxical sleep because in, in the face of REM sleep, our eye, as, it, as, as the word says, REM, the rapid eye movement, the, the eye movements are very rapid, um, and we have dreaming during this type, this um, uh, group, this um, episode of sleep. And um, however, to stop us from acting out the dreams, we have postural atonia. Our EEG waves are very similar to um, the wakeful state, but there is postural muscle atonia to stop us from acting out dreams. So if you have someone coming and telling you that that someone is acting out dreams, flailing out the arms, and in sleep you see as if they're trying to do something, driving a car or making something, using tools, then they're acting out dreams. And that will indicate that they have REM sleep behavior disorder. This is a hypnogram. So you go through five to six cycles of sleep during the night. Sleep is not one static state as you can see in this diagram. You start from awake state and you gradually grow into N1, N2, N3, deeper and deeper sleep. The red lines are the dreaming sleep or the REM sleep. And you can see in the first half of the night, you have a lot of N3 or dreaming sleep, uh, deep sleep. And as you go to the uh, early, part, early hours of the morning, you have more and more dreaming sleep. So in, the, in REM behavior disorders, people will have more of their acting out dreams towards the early hours of the morning. So um, so sleep happens, um, as I said, in 60 to 90 cycles. Um, and right. So why do we sleep? There are several functions. Brain restitution, it's well known that um, sl during sleep, accumulation of beta amyloid is, um, is um, cleared off. Uh, during sleep, the neurotoxins that gather during the daytime is cleared. And sleep deprivation is well known to, call, to lead to accumulation of beta amyloid. And you know that it is associated with Alzheimer's disease. It is um, needed for body restitution, to, to retain our personality, learning and memory consolidation. In, um, uh, so during sleep, uh, so in the wakeful state, we put certain memories, uh, certain data into our uh, transient memory, and it is only during sleep that it gets consolidated. So there is no point in breaking rest before exams. Ment it is important for mental health, it's important for performance, and also it's important for youthful look. So sleep deprivation leads to increased cancer, poor performance, low pain threshold, increased risk of depression, enhanced accident risk, and of course sleepiness. 
Um, so how many hours of sleep should we sleep? Uh, um, so this uh, is a common question, um, and you can see from this diagram that an infant will sleep almost the whole day, uh, mainly spending time in deep sleep, and then they move on to, um, and as they grow older, the amount of deep sleep is, becomes less and less. And it is a population average that someone sleeps for seven to eight hours per day. It is not a sleep prescription. We have to find out how many hours of sleep our body requires. So what I recommend you to do is when you go on a holiday, um, after, so you can let yourself sleep when you feel sleepy and let yourself naturally wake up and see how many hours of sleep that you need. So you may be surprised, you may need only six hours of sleep or you may be someone who needs about 10 hours of sleep. There's no point fighting, uh, fighting against your body's requirements. So if, it is that, if you need that, to sleep disorders. So <clears throat> there are several types of sleep disorders according to the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Um, and the commonest is insomnia. I'm sure you would have um, experienced insomnia at some point in your life, before a stressful period, before an exam. So acute insomnia is where you have insomnia for less than three weeks, and it's quite common. But it becomes chronic insomnia and a disorder when it lasts more than three weeks. And then we have our topic of the day, sleep-related breathing disorders, central disorders of hypersomnolence like narcolepsy, circadian rhythm disorders, where you, s you can't run in a 24-hour pattern. You start uh, sleeping in the daytime, and you are awake in the nighttime, which, which, is, a norm, uh, which is a variant of the genetic makeup, it's in the circadian rhythm disorders. Parasomnia, where uh, that is a group of disorders. For example, REM behavior disorders, non-REM behavior disorders, um, and then you have sleep-related movement disorders. There's a, so there's a whole spectrum of sleep disorders, and in each of these groups, you have um, many, many different disorders that um, I would recommend you to go through um, when you have the time. So sleep-related deep breathing disorders. Um, the commonest one is the sleep apnea syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea. Then you have central sleep apnea, and the uh, central sleep apnea variant, chain stokes breathing that you will remember from your ganong, um, uh, associated with heart failure, high altitude periodic breathing, and drug-induced apneas, for example, with opioids. Then the other group, sleep hypoventilation syndrome, where you have obesity hypoventilation syndrome and hypoventilation associated with neuromuscular disorders such as motor neuron disease or congenital myopathies, Duchenne muscular dystrophies, and so on. Then the third group, sleep-related breathing disorders with chronic respiratory disorders such as COPD, asthma, idiopathic lung fibrosis, skeletal deformities, where, you, where uh, these pathologies lead to nocturnal hypoxemia, which, if unidentified, can lead to um, complications. So let's start off with the common one, obstructive sleep apnea. I will quickly go through the diagnostic criteria. So first thing, um, you, ha you have to ask for symptoms, and then you have to do a diagnostic investigation. So the symptoms uh, are where the patient complains of sleepiness, poor sleep, however much they sleep, they feel as if they haven't slept, fatigue, and, 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 so, and also I would like to emphasize insomnia is a feature of OSA, in, especially in females, especially in the postmenopausal age group. So if someone complains of insomnia, um, 
keep keep an, uh, be alert about OSA as well. Uh, they, they can com complaints of loud snoring, um, breath holding, gasping, uh, waking up uh, suddenly um, where they ha they feel that they have uh, stopped breathing, um, or they they will or they will be brought by a, by the wife or the husband who who are very concerned um, that the that the patient stops breathing in the night. Sometimes you have a spouse waking up the whole night, uh, watching the um, watching the husband or wife uh, sleeping in the night, um, and when they stop breathing, they are, they are very worried and they keep awake to uh, awake that patient up then um, so with the same along with the symptoms you have the polysomnography um, or you can do what is called the out of center sleep study um, which I will discuss the levels of sleep studies so if you have an apnea hypoapnea index of more than five then it is significant for uh, uh, significant for s or sleep apnea always say so apnea is where there is complete cessation of breathing for lasting more than 10 seconds. A hypoapnea is defined as um, there is reduction of the uh, airflow less than 70% along with a 3% desaturation. And then you have respiratory effort related arousals or RERAS where you don't have um, desaturation, you don't meet the criteria for hypoapnea, but there's a slight reduction in the airflow which is associated with arousal. So all this, you, so the a polysomnogram will calculate what, how many apneas, hypone, hypo, hypoapneas, how many RERAs, and then we will get an overall average value, how many apnea, hypoapnea index for uh, one hour. So an AHI more than five is significant. So five to 15 is mild OSA, 15 to 30 is moderate, and more than 30 is severe. However, if you come across a polysomnogram, where your AHI index is more than 15 and the patient still doesn't complain of symptoms, still that is enough evidence to, to diagnose the patient as obstructive sleep apnea. So the risk factors for OSA, we all know that obesity uh, is associated with OSA, apart from that smoking, substance, uh, substance abuse, um, uh, uh, inherited factors such as craniofacial, so you have certain facial structures, receding jaw lines, um, then uh, crowded throats where the melampathy, you look at the throat and you, cla you classify the uh, melampathy grade. So melampathy class three, cla class four throats, increasing age, male gender, are all associated with an increased risk of OSA. <coughs> Um, so you have several questionnaires to identify patients uh, who are at increased uh, ref, uh, risk of uh, OSA. You have the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, which is a scale uh, to identify sleepiness. And you have the stop bank score to identify patients who are at increased risk of OSA. It's a very there are two questionnaires which can be easily done. So OSA more than uh, so score more than three is significant for increased risk of uh, OSA. Then you have the sleep studies. You have a level one sleep study where you do a in ward in in laboratory sleep study with video. You have a level two where you still have uh, all the uh, EEG, EO, electroculogram, chin, EMG, ECG, airflow, respiratory effort mo uh, and movement uh, belts. However, you don't have the video. That is a level two. And a level three is called a respiratory polygraphy where you don't have the, e have the EEG or the EOG, but you have the nasal flow and the chest and abdominal belts. So if you're suspecting only OSA, you can just do respiratory polygraphy as well. Right, so this is a excerpt from a polysomnogram, and you can see in the green uh, the the red lines and the green lines where there is airflow and there is cessation of airflow completely. There are flat red and green lines. Below the red, below the flat red and green lines, you have the chest and abdomen movement in blue where you have movements, you can see the nice movements along with the breathing movement, which are the uh, oscillating waves. And then right in time with the flat waves, you have chest and abdomen trying to move against an obstructed uh, throat. Compared to central sleep apnea, where you have the flow and the thermistor flat, there are apneas, and the chest and abdominal bills are also flat. 
there is no effort in the uh, effort in the chest and abdominal movement, which is characteristic of central sleep apnea. I will move on in the interest of time. So. Um, for the treatment of OSA, you can use uh, the, the first line is CPAP therapy. However, the mandibular advancement device or oral appliances are also commonly tried in mild OSA in other countries. CPAP, you are, I think, familiar now, which, is, which actually acts as a pneumatic splint to open the obstructed airway, and the recommendation is to use it at least five hours in the night for uh, a, a, a positive impact on comorbidities. Central sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea, there are several types, as I said. The primary central sleep apnea, or the idiopathic variety, where you have a no, no cause identified. About 5% of central sleep apneas have no cause identified. But apart from that, if a patient has heart failure, uh, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillations, uh, CNS tumors, strokes, uh, think of the possibility of central sleep apnea when they complain of undue tiredness or excessive sleepiness during the day because in central sleep apnea, they will not be loud snorers like OSA, but they will have the fatigue, the sleepiness, and maybe mild snoring. So I will move on. So um, central sleep apnea, again, the definition is the same. The apnea, hypoapnea index of more than five uh, is the cutoff. What happens is uh, there is a, a, a respiratory the, the respiratory center is affected. You have what you have what is called the apnea threshold. Every one of us has an apnea threshold. When we sleep, our PaCO2 or the arterial carbon dioxide rises about two millimeters of mercury from the uh, awake state. But in people who have uh, who are at risk of central sleep apnea, their apneic threshold is very close to their sleeping carbon dioxide level so that when they take a deep breath, they move in and out of uh, apneas. So this is a graph of um, uh, chain stokes breathing. So you can see nice oscillatory waves uh, followed by apneic uh, events, which is characteristic of, which is called the crescendo decrescendo pattern of uh, chain stokes breathing. Um, so this, for the definition, this, the cycle has to be more than 40 seconds. Long, the cycle length has to be more than 40 seconds. And the longer the cycle, the uh, severe the sleep apnea. Again, the therapy of central sleep apnea, the first line is CPAP therapy. Uh, the CANPAP trial is the trial which uh, depicts the benefit of CPAP therapy in central sleep apnea. You can also use oxygen. The exact mode of oxygen is not known, but it is thought that the supplementation of oxygen reduces the minute ventilation and stabilizes the respiratory centers and thus prevents the fluctuations in the CO2 level. Acetazolamide has a place in ICU setup. If you are work, if we have worked in ICU setup, um, in acute stage, we can use acetazolamide. My final two slides, obesity hypoventilation syndrome. I would like to uh, say a word about it because that is another co uh, uh, common presentation in the acute setting where, pa where very obese patients will admit mostly in right heart failure um, uh, and it is more, it is, has a higher mortality. Undiagnosed OHS has a higher mortality than OSA. It is so apart from being obese, apart from having uh, sleep apneas, they will have daytime hypercapnia. So it is a combination of obstruction as well as um, an impact, a negative impact on respiratory centers leading to alveolar hypoventilation. And as I have stated here, untreated obesity hypoventilation has an 18-month mortality of 23% and when you treat it, actually uh, the mortality falls to 3%. So if you see this kind of persistent desaturation in your respiratory polygraphy or your apnea links or your polysomnograms, always suspect obesity hypoventilation syndrome and you can do a morning arterial blood gas and see if there is a high carbon dioxide, high bicarbonate and diagnose OHS. So uh, there's a lot more to talk uh, when it comes to sleep, sleep-related breathing disorders. I hope this, is, this, uh, this will trigger you to go and read some more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruanti. Um, um, we'll keep the questions for the tea time, I think. Uh, we are able to connect with uh, Dr. Emerson from Australia. Um, 
I think the technical issue is sorted. Good Shall we? Good morning. Um, uh, thank you for all uh, coming for this session and thank you for having me. Um, I'll start off with the case scenario. So a 96-year-old gentleman presents to the emergency department with a raging fever, a productive cough, and acute dyspnea. The chest X-ray reveals right lower lobe consolidation, and he started on intravenous antibiotic therapy for a community-acquired pneumonia. After two hours into his presentation, the patient suddenly pulls out his IV line. He picks up a nearby chair and starts threatening the nurse and junior doctor with it. His wife walks into the room and tells you that he's been having memory problems for the last year. My name is Andrew Emerson, and I'm an aged care specialist and geriatrician at Westmead Hospital in Sydney, Australia. Today, I'll be talking about respiratory diseases in the elderly. How is it different? And for many of you who have looked after our elderly patients, you would realize that this is not an uncommon situation. Before I start the talk, I thought I'd ask you all a very controversial question. This question has resulted in protests in France a couple of weeks ago. The question is, what is the definition of elderly? How old is too old? Is the age 50 and above, 60 and above, or 70 and above? I'll let you all ponder about this question. In Britain in 1875, the Friendly Societies Act enacted the definition of old age as someone who was 50 years old and above. However, at the time, pension schemes were unimpressed and used their own cutoff for someone who was defined as elderly. In the United States, the definition of elderly is someone who's 65 years and older. This is the same definition that we use in Australia. However, the more proper definition of being elderly is by the United Nations, which is 60 years and above. I understand that Sri Lanka follows this definition. Regardless of which definition you use, people across the world are living longer. Our average world life expectancy has increased by almost a decade from 1990 to 2020. There are over 1 billion people in the world over the, age of over the age of 60 in 2020, and that number is expected to rise to 1.4 billion in the next seven years. So what is aging? Biological aging results from an accumulation of both molecular and cellular damage with time. It results in changes in our own human physiology. For example, it results in changes in lung volume, such as decreases in the forced vital capacity and increases in your lung residual volume as the lung loses its elasticity. In the heart, it re results in reductions in the maximum heart rate as the cardiac myocytes respond less frequently to sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Cognitively, there's also changes in the neuron functioning from reductions or slowness in motor speed and delays in memory recall. Apart from the biological changes associated with aging, there's also the increased chance of developing certain non-communicable diseases. These include things such as chronic airways disease, cancers, heart disease, as well as osteoarthritis. Aging is also linked to the development of certain syndromes. Things such as delirium, falls, incontinence, and frailty all become more common as we get older. These are some of the more specific changes that occur in the respiratory tract that occur with aging. The top picture is someone who is from a younger age group, the 20s to 30s, and the bottom one picture is a picture of someone who is much older. And what we can see here is that there is an increase in the airspace size with aging. And as the respiratory muscles atrophy, there's also changes in lung in chest wall compliance, which reduces, and reductions in maximum inspiratory pressure. As well as this, in terms of lung volumes, we get re a reduction in the diffusion capacity across the alveoli and increase in dead space ventilation as we get older. What we find, though, is that people age differently. There is a difference between chronological and biological aging. For example, you may have a 90-year-old female who has a background of hypertension and arthritis, but is independent in the community. They can do their own shopping, manage their own money and medications without much help. However, you may have someone who's 20 years younger, a 70-year-old male, who has a background of heavy smoking, who is on home oxygen, has a background of COPD, and can mobilize only five meters before they become acutely short of breath and dyspneic. 
we can see that there's differences in chronological and biological age. While some of these differences can be genetic, the majority of influence on aging is actually environmental. And while gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status can influence it, environmental factors can actually contribute to bad aging. And it's important to maintain healthy behaviors. So things such as a balanced diet, eating appropriate veggies and fruits, exercise and regular exercise, refraining from tobacco can all lead to a reduction in non-communicable diseases, improve your physical and mental well-being, and delay the need that you need to get care or assistance as you get older. So what about respiratory diseases in the elderly? There are certain diseases that are associated with aging, chronic obstructive airways disease, lung cancers, pulmonary emboli, interstitial lung disease, and sleep disorders are all conditions that increase as we get older. However, when you have a patient who comes in to see you in the clinic or comes in to the emergency department with the respiratory presentation, what we find in the elderly is not all respiratory presentations to hospital just have a problem that's confined to the lungs. Often there's multiple issues going on. For example, you may have someone who's come in with both a, a pneumonia as well as symptoms of heart failure. You may have someone who's having issues with medication compliance because they have an underlying dementia. That means they come in with repeated exacerbations of chronic airways disease. They may present with a delirium if they come in with a respiratory infection to hospital. Or they may have issues taking multiple medications because they're getting multiple interactions such as steroid-induced diabetes or weight gain. Their hospital presentation may take a lot longer because they're more frail and have functional decline during their stay in hospital. So these are all complications that can happen as we get older. I'll start off with another case. So we have a 96 year old uh, gentleman who presents to the hospital once again with a three day history of productive cough, fevers and dyspnea at rest. He's a, he has a 30 year packet history of smoking. He's unvaccinated to influenza and COVID and is a retired school teacher. On examination, he's hypotensive, tachycardic, hypoxic and febrile. He's disoriented to time and place and has once again right lower lobe um, consolidation on the chest x-ray. He started on intravenous antibiotic therapy, but then starts yelling at his doctors and nursing staff to go away. He refuses his medications and has poor attention. His wife says this is not like him at all and has reported that there's been no problems with his memory prior to this. What's going on? This is an example of delirium. And delirium is an acute confusional state that typically develops over hours to days. It results in disturbances in someone's attention and awareness of the environment, but it also affects a cognitive domain, whether it be memory, orientation, or perception. They may have hallucinations and delusions at the time, and it's associated with a medical problem. Delirium is derived from the Latin D, which means out, and lie, which means rut, or get out of the rut, as it's translated in, in Latin. And there are three forms of delirium. Uh, the first form is hyperactive delirium, where they can become agitated and have hallucinations. Um, this is the most exciting form, but is not actually the most common. The second form is hypoactive delirium, where they're stuporous, lethargic, and often don't cause problems on the ward. It's actually the form of delirium that people often ignore, and it's actually the type of delirium that's associated with the most mortality in hospital, and it's something we have to be aware of. There's also mixed delirium as well. Delirium is associated with 30% of presentations to hospital uh, for elderly patients under a general medicine team. It's associated with 70% of hospital presentations into ICU, and it's associated with 80% of presentations who have an invasive technique such as surgery. So it's something we have to be aware of. The gold standard for definition of delirium is the DSM-5 criteria, which is shown on the right. In studies that were taken both during the COVID pandemic, as well as even prior, it was found that delirium is associated with increased mortality, length of stay, and permanent cognitive impairment if left untreated. And treatment of delirium um, relies on treating the underlying cause. There are a number of predisposing factors to delirium. The main one is age, an underlying cognitive impairment, such as dementia or previous history of delirium. Um, sensory impairments, such as hearing or visual impairment. Things such as dehydration and malnutrition and coexisting medical diseases such as severe respiratory diseases, neurological diseases, and even things such as uh, metabolic diseases like diabetes can all predispose to delirium. 
precipitating factors include things such as a sepsis, a, a respiratory sepsis, a vascular event such as a stroke, drugs such as steroids that we use for management of um, chronic airways disease, anticholinergic medication, um, such as even your antihistamines that you can get over the counter. Things such as the cancer, as well as a change in environment, can all lead to a change in someone's mental state and precipitate a delirium. So you may have that patient coming from the intensive care to the regular ward, and suddenly they become confused. That could be a precipitant for a delirium. Delirium workup always involves uh, getting a, a very detailed history, both from the family and observers about what's happening. Um, it involves looking at possible medications, and this could include herbal medications and other over-the-counter med, uh, alcohol history, as well as a history of um, use of drugs of abuse, like benzodiazepines, is also important. And also look for mass signs of delirium, someone who's having falls all of a sudden who's never had a fall, or someone who's incontinent who has never been incontinent before. These can be signs that there may be an underlying delirium going on. An exam involves a neurological exam, looking for features of a stroke, Parkinsonism, or a metabolic disorder. A mental state exam and looking through other systems as well. And screening tools that we use in hospital or in the community include the 4AT and confusion assessment method or CAM, which I'll be talking about. Some of the blood panel markers include things such as looking at your electrolytes, renal function, hepatic markers, and drug levels as well. And if there's any neurological signs or signs of a stroke or vascular event, we look, um, we would do imaging of the brain. And there are some special tests that we would use for the rarer causes, such as non-convulsive seizures, as well as encephalitis as well. These are the two most commonest delirium screening tools. So the um, tool on the right was invented in the US uh, by Sharon Inouye and team. Uh, it's known as the confusion assessment method. Um, and essentially, it involves looking at four criteria. You have to have three of the four, so an acute onset and fluctuating state associated with inattention needs to be present. And you either have disorganized thinking or alterations in your level of consciousness. This is tool number one. It has about an 80, uh, 82% uh, uh, sensitive, uh, sensitivity and close to a 90% specificity. The second tool, which is a newer um, delirium screening tool known as the 4AT, is something that is more commonly used nowadays. Uh, it looks at alertness, orientation, attention, and changes in cognition. One of the good advantages of this tool is it doesn't need uh, training. It takes less than two minutes to do. Um, it can differentiate cognitive impairment and delirium, and it can be used in people with visual or hearing impairments. Its sensitivity is around 83% and uh, specificity around 87%. Management of delirium involves identifying and treating the underlying cause. And we have clinical care guidelines that we use um, in Sydney and in other parts as, as well, it involves looking at other factors that can contribute to confusion, such as making sure that we uh, treat someone's pain, metabolic disturbances, making sure they have adequate hydration, minimizing the use of antipsychotics and preventing falls and pressure injuries. It also involves making sure that we optimize their sensory environment. For example, making sure that they have their spectacles and hearing aids when they come into hospital, making sure there are calendars and clocks around the room to help orientate them, and bringing in familiar objects from families as well. The Hospital Elder Life Program was invented by a Harvard professor, uh, Professor Inouye, and looked at non-pharmacological measures to reduce the complications of delirium. It involves some of the things already mentioned, such as making sure someone's oxygenation, hydration, and nutrition are optimal, but it also involved a multi-component intervention um, led by nurses and volunteers on the ward, which looked at uh, the use of early mobilization, promotion of sleep, and provision of vision and hearing adaptations to help improve someone's recovery from delirium and reduce the complications of falls, pressure sores, malnourishment, and isolation. Some of the other tools that we use include the top five, and this involves um, finding out um, strategies to personalize care in the hospital setting. So this involves talking to a carer, obtaining personal information about a patient and personalizing that care and involving five strategies, things such as um, if someone's fidgeting, that could indicate that they may be hungry or have unmet needs, such as they're in pain, um, or if unsettled, what sort of things will help settle them. This is an important slide because it looks at, I guess, medications that um, we sometimes use. And while we try and avoid antipsychotics and medications in delirium, in some people with hyperactive delirium, they, they are necessary. Um, as many of you know, in respiratory failure or severe hepatic failure, we avoid uh, benzodiazepines at all costs. 
we generally start to try off with uh, atypical antipsychotics at low doses, but also be wary of the the um, medical complications associated with it. Um, in people with a prolonged QT, um, you may have to avoid antipsychotics totally. And in this particular case, if there's no respiratory depression, things such as lorazepam, which are quite fast acting and easily metabolized without the liver are very useful. This is an example of a pharmacological management strategy we used at our, our center um, for patients who come in with a hyperactive delirium with COVID. And while we always start off with non-pharmacological measures, in severe cases, we sometimes have to use low-dose antipsychotic therapy if they're having delusions and hallucinations. And we um, then tend to avoid antipsychotics if someone has Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, or is sensitive to neuroleptics. And in that case, we use um, I guess, rapidly acting benzodiazepines such as lorazepam, which we try and avoid in someone with severe respiratory failure. The next case is a 75-year-old gentleman who's an ex-smoker of 40 packet years, comes in with a non-infective exacerbation of chronic obstructive airways disease. He's on serotide and theotropium, um, and he has essentially a, a severe appearing spirometry result. His wife reports concerns with him using his puffer over the last year. He's been on inhaler therapy for 15 years, and she notes that he's had a decline in his short-term memory. His mini mental is only 23 out of 30, which is a bit borderline for cognitive impairment. One of the things many of you may realize is that um, as someone has a chronic lung disease, it also is associated with the development of cognitive impairment and in some cases, dementia later in life. There have been many studies which have shown an association in people with poorly controlled lung disease and cognitive impairment. So what is dementia? Dementia is a syndrome of acquired global cognitive impairment of intellectual function, which occurs in the setting of a clear consciousness, unlike delirium. It in involves impairment in two more cognitive domains. Um, the way I remember it is the acronym PALMS. So this could be praxis um, or ability to do procedural skills, abstract thinking and judgment, language skills, um, such as uh, forgetting words or being repetitive, memory skills, and visual, spatial, or perceptual skills. And it involves no acute features of a psychiatric illness and an absence of features of delirium. Unlike delirium, dementia occurs over months to years. Um, it is progressive, it gets worse with time, and it attention is less impaired in dementia and psychomotor function is often normal, unlike in delirium. There are different types of dementia and that's something most people um, will realize with time Alzheimer's dementia is one of more than 100 different types of dementia. And while it's the most commonest form, dementias don't always present with memory impairment. So there's the cortical dementias like Alzheimer's, where episodic memory impairment uh, is quite common. Um, language skills are affected as well as praxis and visual spatial skills. But there are the subcortical types of dementia, things such as vascular dementia, progressive supernuclear palsy, Huntington's, where um, essentially episodic memory may not actually be affected, first of all. They may get slowness in their general day-to-day -day life called bradyphrenia. They may have become cha having changes in their personality or apathy. They may have visual spatial skill problems, um, such as problems driving. And these are types of dementia that are a bit more trickier to pick up, uh, but it's often alerted by family and friends. In terms of the commonest forms of dementia, so Alzheimer's, which is 70% of dementias, occurs with episodic memory impairment. For example, they may forget what they've done that day. They may be repetitive, forget conversations. Vascular dementia involves executive impairment. They may not be able to tie up their laces or uh, dress themselves when they can do that a year ago. Dementia with Lewy bodies is, can involve visual hallucinations, Parkinsonism, and fluctuations in their, in their cognition. And this occurs over months or years, not acutely over hours or days. Frontotemporal dementia is associated with impairment in their language skills and behavioral skills. There are many reversible causes of dementia, so we often screen for these. These can be things such as hypothyroidism, vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and many more. So there's a lot of different other types of dementia that we look for when we're screening. These are some of the screening tools that we use. The mini mental state exam was invented back in the 1980s. Um, it's essentially very good for screening for an Alzheimer's dementia, but it's often affected by education as well as language. And it's more commonly used in our English speaking population. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes to use and it looks at the domains of attention, memory recall and language and visual construction. 
I guess the cutoff point is 24 out of 30, but even though someone may have a normal many mental state exam, it doesn't mean that they don't have dementia. The RUDA, so Roland Universal Dementia Scale, was invented in Australia and Sydney. It was used for non-English speaking patients and people with a lower education level. That's less than a year 12 level of education. Um, it's very useful and it can be done in a shorter time than a mini mental state exam. And its cutoff point is 23 out of 30. But once again, the cutoff doesn't always, um, it's not always associated with uh, dementia, even in people with normal um, cognitive scores. Um, we look at the different subscores and see which area of deficits they have and what pattern it's producing. The Montreal Cognitive Assessment was used to identify people with a mild cognitive impairment. The good news is it comes in 51 languages. So it comes in Sinhalese, Tamil, Portuguese, English, um, as well as many other languages. Uh, it looks at the frontal executive features um, so that are seen in vascular dementia and frontal executive uh, and frontal dementia and Parkinson's dementia. Um, it takes a bit longer to complete than the other cognitive tests and its cutoff point is 26 out of 30. Um, it is influenced by, by education level as well. So we do add on one point if they have less than a year 12 level education. So why is dementia important? Well, dementia actually may be a factor contributing to mem medication adherence. And if someone does develop a de dementia or cognitive impairment, it can mean that they're less likely to be, um, I guess, ad adherent with their uh, medication regime. In a study looking at community dwelling patients by insulin colleagues, he found out that executive impairment and working memory were the two most associated uh, conditions to have an impact on medication adherence. And the Methods of monitoring this involve looking at the pharmacy in terms of how well they renew their scripts and medications and pill counting. This is a medication adherence checklist, and I, I understand it's about an 80% um, sensitivity for picking up someone who's not adherent to medications and 100% specificity. Some strategies for helping with medication adherence involve the dosette box, which is where we package medications according to the date of the week, and the Webster pack, which is packaged by the pharmacist in terms of um, times of the day and days of the week to help monitor which medication were taken at what time. Case three, an 80 year old gentleman with asbestosis presents with a productive cough, dyspnea and a sore throat. He's living at home with his wife and mobilizing uh, with a four wheel walker. He requires some assist with showering and his COVID swabs are all negative. He's diagnosed with a community acquired pneumonia, but after five days of being treated with antibiotics, he is found to be bed bound and unable to transfer out of bed. What's happening here? Frailty is um, a syndrome of physiological decline that occurs later in life with marked vulnerability to outside stresses and is associated with adverse health outcomes. It's associated with an increased risk of death, falls, disability, and procedural complications. There have been many studies which have looked at frailty and the impact on respiratory disease. What we find is that frailty is an independent factor associated with a poorer outcome in patients with chronic long-term respiratory disease. There are a number of tools to assess frailty. The physical frailty scale and the frail scale are some of the tools that look at someone who's pre-frail, um, frail and severely frail. And it looks at factors such as weight loss, exhaustion, weakness, and um, ability to care for oneself. There are a number of other tools which are more commonly used in a hospital or clinic setting. The Freed's frailty model is useful um, in assessing for someone rapidly with, for frailty. Um, the only uh, issue with this model is it's not useful in someone with dementia or someone who has a cognitive impairment with a mini mental score less than 18. It's not been validated in this population. The Rockwood clinical frailty scale is what we commonly use in hospital. It's very useful because it's, it can be done on someone who hasn't had very much uh, training in the, in the tool. Um, and it use, uses pictures as well as um, descriptions to identify people from fit, uh, vulnerable to mild to severely frail. Dr. Emerson? Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, sorry, I will have to wind up uh, because of time. The, the yes. Next session is about okay, I'll do that. Thank you. So, so these are some of the frailty skills. Workup of frailty involves excluding other factors, including malignancy, rheumatological disease, and depression. And treatment involves establishing clear goals of care, uh, improving performance and well-being, and medication reviews and reviewing nutrition. There's no evidence for testosterone or growth hormone for treatment of frailty. And one of the things it's useful for is when we have a do a comprehensive assessment called the comprehensive geriatric assessment, we're able to look at multiple factors and how they interact, uh, including psychological and functional 
uh, factors. So these are some of the things that we look at with the functional um, and medical problems with the comprehensive geriatric assessment. We look at their ability to care for themselves, looking at their dressing and eating, their instrumental activities, so things such as more complex tasks like shopping and financial planning. We look at advanced care plans and goals of care. And we also look at advanced care planning as well. In someone who has chronic lung disease, who is breathless at rest or on minimal exertion, we have to think about planning for their end of life. And it can be a clue in terms of having that end of life conversation on what the appropriate goals of care would be and what ceilings of care we should institute. Um, in terms of the last care, so we have a 75 year old woman presenting with a background of Alzheimer's, um, living at home with her husband, but requiring assistance with most care. She was found to be hypoxic. Um, she was found to have peripheral airspace changes and was found to be COVID positive. In terms of the plan, um, it's identifying the main issues. So in this particular case, using the comprehensive geriatric assessment, I think um, the main issues are her COVID pneumonitis, acute kidney injury, um, and her uh, delirium as well. Um, making sure we address her functional needs, including her activities of daily living, and looking at her cognition and monitoring ways of keeping her oriented to place and looking at her polypharmacy and frailty. Um, that's the end of my talk, but uh, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Dr. Emerson, uh, for that comprehensive talk and uh, helping us. Uh, since uh, we are short of time, uh, we will be winding up this session. The local speakers are available at T for uh, the for any questions, and there are some uh, presentations and 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 uh, this thing. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a small. Um, there are a few small announcements to be made before we wind up the session. Um, before before we go on to the tea break, I'd like the college of um, college would like to show show its gratitude to Dr. Preeti Vijayakumarana for his presence today, and they have arranged a small token of appreciation, which will be awarded by Dr. Geetal Pereira. Also, the college informs the seven shortlisted uh, authors of the poster presentation competition to be at the Ivy Hall, which is at the lobby, by 11 a.m. with their uh, respective co-authors. Alongside, the college also informs the pediatric presenting authors for abstract 44 and 83, named Dr. Mihira Manamperi and Dr. Rajita Jayasekara, to be at the registration desk to verify their identity. With that being said, um, we have um, um, the presentation uh, for the presenters who were there, to, who presented at the symposium today, and I, I kindly invite Dr. Geetal Pereira to hand over the tokens of appreciation and the certificates. Thank you very much, sir. So with that, we like to announce that we'll be moving on to tea, and our next session will next symposium will be starting at 10:20 a.m.